to the Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts here at Old Salem Museums and Gardens. I'm Daniel Ackerman. I'm the chief curator at Old Salem and Mazda. And today, I'm really looking forward to taking you into some of our galleries to hear some of the more hidden stories, stories that you may not be familiar with, but really deserve to be better known. And I wanted to begin, actually, with one of the most important objects that entered our collection during the past decade or so, and it's this dressing bureau by a cabinet maker here in North Carolina named Thomas Day. Now, if there's one cabinet maker who even an elementary school child in North Carolina knows about, it would be Thomas Day. He's part of our state curriculum, and that's because Thomas Day lived a really remarkable life in the decades leading up to the American Civil War. In 1850, Thomas Day in Milton, North Carolina, operated the largest cabinet shop in the state. And Thomas Day was black. He was a free black man who was born in Virginia, probably learned to be a cabinet maker from his father, moved to North Carolina, and established his shop around 1820 in Milton, North Carolina. Now, Day's shop was one of the earliest shops in North Carolina to really embrace mass production, machine tools, steam technology. I mean, in a way, you can draw a line from Thomas Day's workshop to the high point furniture uh, business of the 20th and 21st century. Day managed to do this despite the fact that he was a black man in a um, slaveholding state. Now, this put him at a lot of disadvantages. Um, Day could not sue in court. So if you bought something from him on credit and then didn't pay, Day couldn't take you to court. Day couldn't even marry his wife, who lived in Virginia, without a special dispensation from the General Assembly that actually would allow her to leave Virginia and come to North Carolina. And yet, he managed to create a shop and a group of patrons who you know, were eager to purchase the furniture he was making in what he would have described at the time as the newest and most fashionable styles. And in fact, his ability to embrace technology meant that he was attracting other craftspeople to come work for him, even craftspeople um, here in uh, Salem went up to work in Day's workshop in Milton. Day's furniture is very typical of what we might call the Empire period. Um, its use of veneers, shapes, um, the sort of carving on the feet. One of the things that makes Day's furniture, I think, really distinctive in North Carolina is his carving. Um, Day tended to uh, carve and embellish his furniture in ways that um, really marked it as uniquely his. Day made a huge amount of furniture. Um, he made furniture for people who would become governors, senators, even the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill um, had objects made by Day because he was simply able to produce high quality furniture at a very reasonable cost because of his investments in technology. But behind that veneer, um, Day was also, we now know, a secret abolitionist. Um, public um, research published by the Chipstone Foundation just a few years ago actually reveals that at various points he left the state to attend abolitionist meetings and he sent his children to school in Massachusetts where he felt like they could get a real education um, which would not have been available to them here in North Carolina as um, as African Americans. And so, you know, Day working in the period before the Civil War really is this um, exceptional story, which is why he's so well known. But as we go through a few of the other objects in the collection, we'll be talking about stories that are much more hidden, stories that really require the kind of research we're known for here at Mazda to, um, to uncover. So I'd like to go ahead and step into the McNamara Masterworks Gallery, where we can take a look at a few of these objects and talk about how it is we know what we know about the people who lived and worked in the early American South. So follow me. So welcome to the McNamara Masterworks Gallery. This is where some of the most important and iconic objects in Mezda's collection are displayed. Now, one of the things about Mezda is that, and Old Salem, is that we are as much a research and educational institution as we are a place where, if it weren't for COVID, you might come and, and sort of enjoy a day. 
And so my colleagues um, in our research division actually spend their time looking at what we call primary source documents. So sort of the written records of the past, wills, inventories, um, deeds, newspapers, in an effort to document the craftspeople who lived and worked in the early South. I mean, you may be familiar in our social media feed with our Artisans of the South series that my colleague Kim May produces. Those are all based on this reading we do. And in fact, we've identified nearly 100,000 Southern craftsmen through that effort. Um, and one of the things we try to do at MESDA is to reconnect craftspeople and communities with the objects they made and used. And so in the course of reading all of these early records, we've been able to document by name nearly 3,500 enslaved craftspeople. Those are craftspeople who were enslaved, whose names we know. We've documented about another 1,500 black free craftspeople. But then, and this is really important, we've also documented a large, large thousands of craftspeople who enslaved people. And that's critical because we may look at objects like these and think of them as being the work of, of sort of a solitary craftsperson in their shop, but that's really not how these shops were organized. To make a piece of furniture, a piece of silver, required many hands. Not just the master of the shop, the person whose name might be associated it, with it, who may have signed it or marked it, but also the work of laborers um, from the person who um, chopped down the mahogany tree uh, and knew how to properly saw that wood to get the right kind of, of surface on it, all the way through to people in the workshop who dimensioned and planed and, and did joinery work, down to the finishing work. These are the products of multi-person workshops. And so our efforts in trying to identify the names of all of these Southern craftsmen, these 95 or 100,000 craftsmen, is to get beyond just the person whose name is on the object and try to restore the names and skill of all those people to the things they made. One of the best objects to demonstrate this point is actually in this case here. Um, these are a pair of silver coffee pots that were made in Charleston, South Carolina, probably in the 1750s, um, and they're marked by a Scottish-born silversmith named Alexander Petrie. And it's interesting, they're, they're virtually identical with the exception of the, of the reposé decoration. Um, Petrie and his shop would have had you know, the, the, the plain example, and then if you wanted to pay extra, you could have that, you know, embellished with all of that um, reposé decoration. Now, Petrie, as a silversmith, um, is the master of the shop. He's the one who's responsible for it. He's the one who stamps his mark on the bottom of the objects. But we know that Petrie also had enslaved silversmiths working within his shop. And we know that because when he died, his inventory actually includes an enslaved silversmith named Abraham. And then months later, when his, when his estate goes for sale, um, Abraham is auctioned and is purchased by another silversmith named Jonathan Sarazen. Now, you may be wondering, you know, how do we know what Abraham was actually doing in the shop? And that's a, that's a really good question. You know, this is where trying to gather as much evidence as possible is so critical. We can read uh, Petrie's advertisements in the 1750s and 60s, and we actually read where he met, talks to, where he actually says, you know, I'm retiring, I'm closing down the shop. And he does this several years before he dies. However, when he dies, he still has a shop, all of his tools, and Abraham, which raises this really interesting question. You know, if he has the shop, if he has the tools, and he has a skilled silversmith working for him, who's actually in the shop producing goods during that period of time? And the answer, I think, really is Abraham. And the fact that at Petrie's estate sale, Abraham is fought over by other silversmiths um, is, I think, a key piece of evidence. It tells us that this is a really skilled individual who is in high demand 
among the silversmithing community in Charleston. And in fact, shortly after Abraham is enslaved by Jonathan Sarazen, we actually find uh, Sarazen's list of things he's selling in the newspaper expands. So it almost gives us this hint that by acquiring Abraham and his skill, he's able to increase his own shop's output. And so that's how we take all of these sort of primary source records that we, um, that we gather and try to add depth and humanity back to the many hands who are behind these, these kinds of objects. Um, I'm going to pause for a second just in case we have any questions or if people have anything that sort of caught their eye while we're, while we're in this gallery. I've got the chat open, and unfortunately I can't see if anybody's commenting on Facebook, but no questions as of yet. But if you wanted to be a little experimental with me and take the phone and show a few things, I can check Facebook comments. Absolutely, I'd love to do that. So we're going to look at a couple other things while we're in here. Let's see, we're going to go ahead and take a look at this pair of paintings here on the wall. Now, these paintings are by uh, an African-American craftsman or artist named Joshua Johnson. Uh, Joshua Johnson was actually born um, into slavery in the 1760s in Maryland, um, was apprenticed to a blacksmith, and then following his apprenticeship decided blacksmithing wasn't for him and that he'd rather be an artist. And over the past decade or two, a lot of scholarship has helped us understand Johnson's life far more clearly. For example, for many years we weren't sure who his parents were. And then in the mid-90s, a piece of evidence uh, surfaced to tell us that he was um, the son of a white father and a black enslaved mother, and that his father actually was forced to purchase his freedom and then manumit him. Um, Johnson's work resonated among Baltimore's sort of growing middle class in the early 19th century. Baltimore as a city really takes off in the years following the establishment of the United States of America. And there is this growing middle class there uh, who are eager to have representations of themselves. And so Johnson, and we see him advertising, we see him in the um, city directories, you know, He's fulfilling that desire among the merchant class, people like Benjamin Yo and his wife, Susanna, to have themselves uh, memorialized in painting. Now, I'm a furniture geek, so I love the details in paintings. And so one of the things I like most about Johnson's work is that you know, he often pays as much attention to the surroundings of the sitter as he does the sitter and their children. Um, so you see this really wonderful uh, Windsor chair with a carved terminal scroll. And then here, the sofa with all of the decorative tack work around it. So Johnson's an incredibly important story uh, and one that we're happy to have here at Mesda. Um, and we're lucky because his work really has become much better known over the past couple decades and has become really hard to obtain. And so we're lucky that, that this pair of paintings have been here now in the collection for uh, three or four decades. Those are remarkable. Thank you so much, Daniel. I checked Facebook and we should have all comments funneling through here, so we should be all Perfect, set. perfect. Well, so furniture, of course, and silver, we can find these, um, these sort of hidden hands of enslaved craftspeople. I'd like to move into our ceramics gallery now too, though, because Really, that's a place where the role of enslaved artisans has really become much more understood over the past few decades. And um, so why don't you follow me? And we're going to go ahead into the Mariner Ceramics Gallery and take yes. a look. Yes, please. So welcome to the William and Susan Mariner Southern Ceramics Gallery. We're um, fortunate that between the Mariner collection, the Mesda collection, and the Old Salem collection, we really do have the most representative collection of early Southern pottery really anywhere. Um, pottery made here in Salem, in Piedmont, North Carolina, up and down the Great Wagon Road in Virginia, um, and then down into North and South Carolina, and then Georgia, as well as Tennessee and Kentucky earthenware, stoneware, different kind of glazing techniques. 
um, but pottery really representing um, all the different traditions that existed in the early South. Now, there are two big stories that I want to talk about in here, um, both of which um, actually involve the production of stoneware. So for those who, you know, aren't familiar with these kind of terms, just, you know, the, the briefest introduction to pottery, um, the pottery in here falls into two big categories. There's earthenware and there's stoneware. They're both made of clay. Uh, earthenware tends to be a, a coarser, redder often clay. Stoneware tends to be a more refined, um, usually a grayer, whiter clay. Now, they're fired at very different temperatures. Um, stoneware is fired at a much hotter temperature. Um, both require glazing, though. Now, with earthenware, you usually glaze it with lead, um, which creates you know, these, these beautiful, beautiful surfaces. Um, the problem is it's lead. And um, so it's beautiful, but it'll kill you. Um, whereas stoneware can be glazed using different techniques, um, most often in the South, salt glazing, which means while it's actually being fired, uh, salt is thrown into the kiln, it vaporizes, settles back, uh, and creates a watertight um, surface, or alkaline or ash glazing, which is where uh, a, a combination of liquid clay and um, wood ash is sort of dipped uh, and then that too creates this very glassy, impervious surface. Big benefit of stoneware is that um, it is impervious to acids, and so you can use it for things like pickling, um, which you can't do with earthenware because the lead will actually leach out uh, into the into the pickles. Double bad. Double bad. Yeah. Um, yeah. It not not the kind of tang you're going for in your pickle. <laughs> just joining us this does have a chat feature so please feel free to drop your questions for uh, chief curator daniel ackerman below love to hear them so this is one of my absolute favorite jars in the collection um i love this thing um i first saw it when i was um still at, when i was just starting out in my career and i was working at the met in new york and this came to the winter antique show where mazda was the guest um the guest exhibitor um, I'd never seen anything like it and have just always loved it. It's by a man named David Jarbour, and, and we know that because he's really boldly signed it uh, on the base underneath. Uh, and you can go to our website and actually pull it up in the collections catalog and get a great picture of that signature. Um, David Jarbour was a potter who worked in Alexandria, Virginia, um, in the early part of the 19th century, and, and he worked in the salt glaze stoneware potteries there. So this is salt glaze stoneware. It's kind of got a pebbly surface, and then it's decorated with a, a cobalt slip. So a slip is when you add to a pot uh, to, to then decorate it, um, and when you fire the pot with the, this cobalt slip, it turns this really vivid uh, deep blue color. It's beautiful, Daniel. Do you know what chemicals go into making that color? Uh, well, so it's cobalt, which is a mineral, and I'm not exactly sure what is in cobalt. I can't remember from my uh, early attempts to be a geologist. <laughs> Mineralogy is what got me out of being a geologist, because if it hadn't, I'd be able to tell you exactly what it is. But, well, um, from a decorative art standpoint, it's a stunning color. It's really beautiful. I see it a lot in this collection. Yeah, so cobalt blue is a really popular decorating color um, when it comes to salt clay stoneware. Um, because it does give you that really wonderful surface. And um, what Jarbor has done here is he's sort of um, created this large floral design in this very impressionistic hand um, that he becomes known for. And Mezda.org is where people can find it. They absolutely can. Mezda.org, you can go visit the collection and just type in um, Jarbor or just click ceramics and browse through the whole ceramics collection to see, to see more of his work. David Jarbour um, was actually very recently the subject of an article in the Mesda Journal by a friend of mine, Angelica Kuttner, who's curator at Colonial Williamsburg. Um, and what she was able to do is really add to what we knew of his life. Um, David Jarbour was born enslaved um, in about 1820. 
he was able to purchase his own freedom. Um, he had been trained as a potter previous to that point. So he's trained as a potter, he's enslaved, he's working in the Alexandria, Virginia potteries. In 1820, he buys his freedom, but he continues to make pottery. You know, that, that's his trade. Um, ten years later, he throws this pot, uh, and he proudly signs it, and dates it, and writes Alexandria, D.C. on the bottom. So, you know, he's, he's clearly aware that this is a monumental achievement. And anybody who's ever tried to, to throw a pot this size, you know, immediately understands how much work this is. And you're using a combination of different techniques to try to create to try to sort of force the clay into this, um, into this scale. Um, it's unclear why exactly he makes this pot, why he, he sort of makes this expression in 1830. My theory is that that's around the time that the lead potter where he's working leaves and he's really trying to show that he's skilled enough to, um, to take on that role himself. But I encourage you to go to the Mesda Journal, mesdajournal.org, or through our website, uh, and read Angelica's really wonderful and detailed article all about uh, David Jarbour, and, and even more than that, the lives of the other free black potters in these potteries. Because, you know, that's the thing to remember. So we have a David Jarbour. Um, we have a Thomas Day. We have these touchstones whose names we know, but they're really just the tip of the iceberg. And so for every David Jarbour who works in the pottery and signs the pot, we can go to the census records and see that they are just one of many black individuals in those spaces um, working. Probably the best example of that is actually even further south when we get into Edgefield, South Carolina, um, because there we really see the establishment of what really can be described as pottery plantations. But before we do that, I wanted to pause and just see if there were any questions that um, people might have. No, Daniel, not that I can see, but we do have a few people watching with you, so I guess just keep doing your thing. And if anybody has anything they'd like to ask about specifically, please do. We can stop and, and talk about it. Sounds perfect. So, you know, Edgefield, South Carolina is probably one of the most well-known um, pottery production areas in the American South. Um, and in many ways, it's so well known because of this artist uh, who signed his work simply Dave, but who we know better as David Drake, um, a name he took after emancipation, uh, Drake being the name of the first person who enslaved him. Uh, Dave was a masterful potter, uh, and his work would be uh, immediately recognizable and appreciated even without the remarkable story it represents. Um, Dave was born enslaved. He was taught to be a potter. He worked at a number of the pottery factories in the Edgefield district. Edgefield, um, which is near Aiken, sort of south of Columbia, sort of between Columbia and Augusta, Georgia, um, had a few key things in the early 19th century. It had access to really good stoneware clay. It had a lot of trees, and it was on good transportation routes. And those three things allowed it to develop at the hands of entrepreneurs into something that, that some people referred to as the juggery of South Carolina. So a world without plastic, stoneware is your go-to food storage vessel. And so Edgefield is producing that. And they're producing it using this alkaline glaze, which has this outside extra advantage of not requiring imported salts in order to glaze it. Uh, if you are firing pottery in the 19th century, you have no shortage of wood ash. And that's what you need to create this kind of, of glassy glaze surface. Now, Dave takes things a step further. When Dave is enslaved by Lewis Miles, he begins to not only sign and date his pots, but also inscribe poetry on them. So let's keep in mind for a second that in South Carolina in the 1850s, it's illegal to teach your enslaved individuals to read or write. And here Dave is doing both. And I usually um, 
compare this almost like a legal document, like an affidavit. Here, here Dave is signing his name. He's telling you who he's enslaved by. He's dating it. And then on here on the other side, he's actually inscribing it with a couplet. So he's proving that he can do more than just write his name or put a date down or mark a piece of pottery. No, he's proving he can read and write. And, and here he actually inscribes into the pot, I saw a leopard in a lion's face, and then I felt the need of grace, which is probably an adaptation from the book of Revelations. Um, but his other pots really run the gauntlet. Some um, are funny uh, and refer to storing, you know, pig and bear and grease inside the pots, just sort of a reminder that these things are, are functional vessels. Some are really poignant where he wonders where has all of his relations gone. So he's actually, you know, thinking about the people who were torn away from him because of slavery. Um, they're remarkable vessels. Um, and, and Dave, like David Jarbour, is this one voice that really speaks to us because he writes on his vessels. He sort of, um, he's able to speak to us, whereas, you know, all of the other um, enslaved individuals at these potteries are unable to, to do that. Um, and yet their hands are on these vessels just as much. In fact, you know, we know in Dave's later years that um, he has lost a leg because of a railroad incident. And so, in fact, in a way, his later work really is collaborative in nature. He is using his hands, his skill to shape these pots, but another enslaved individual is responsible for kicking the wheel and keeping it moving. We're really just still um, breaking the surface on what we know about Edgefield pottery. Uh, and there's some great work being done by colleagues um, throughout the South and really throughout the country about the work that's happening in this place. And it's really critical as we think about the larger South because as the 19th century moves on, as the South goes to include places like Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Texas, it's potters from the Edgefield district who are continuing that migration pattern. And so if, for example, you look at 19th century Texas pottery, you're going to see similarities, and those similarities are going to exist because um, potters, their family, and enslaved individuals with them are all making that trek further west. So it really is this touchstone um, to so much of Southern pottery really in this material kind of all around us. This is great, Daniel. I'm wondering, just in case I can't see chat feature, Yeah. Um, would you be willing to kind of wrap on YouTube and then we can restart again on Facebook Live? Absolutely. I want to make sure I'm not missing people's questions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, well, it's been really fun taking you on this quick walk through um, some of the Mesda collection. Um, we can't wait to have you back here with us in person with these things. But until we do, follow us on Facebook, on Instagram, on TikTok, on Twitter, and of course through our websites, oldsalem.org and mesda.org, um, where you'll find more information on these stories. Thank you all so much. We're going to hop over to Facebook Live.